that there are folks down here in town that now come to the house, quit talking to the public, they are the most important thing in the world on campus. So, um, you know, be sure to uh, welcome everyone, meet some new friends, get out of your zone, and all those good things. A couple of quick housekeeping tips. Uh, if you go out, there are a couple of restrooms right out the hall. Um, for rooms, when we go to the breakout sessions, some are located down there. On the second floor to carry. So if you're in the elevator, it'll be LL for Sutton and two for the to carry rooms up there. Again, I'll be floating around, ask, ask anyone that's around and all that good stuff. Um, if you need Wi-Fi and you're from USM, hit the student access. You'll see a student access and you'll be able to grab that as you go down. Um, microphones, if you're asking questions in here. All the tables have these handy dandy little microphones on them. Pull one over close to yourself. Hold and talk. So hold and talk as you're going through there. And we'll, we'll end up saying it again, but that's okay. It's all fun. So. Hold and talk as you're going through there so everybody in the room and those joining us via the stream can join us. So welcome those joining us via the scene. Glad to see you. And last and not least, by any means not least, when you're in your breakout sessions, there will be evaluation forms. So go ahead, please fill those out there. It's very handy. The, and then when you're done, you can hand them to the presenter. They are formative assessments for the presenter because you know that's what we do here, teaching and learning and all that good stuff. So um, it'll it'll help them with their program as well. And I think that is all. So without further ado, to kick things off, I'm going to introduce the director of the Center for Excellence for of Teaching and Learning, Mark Evanfield. Thank you. Carl for doing the introductions and yes Sutton Lounge is hard to find even if you've been here um, I, I haven't been there for a while and I managed to go out an emergency exit I actually went down the side stairwell thinking I was going down Sutton Lounge then the door locked behind me then I had to go out the emergency exit I felt it wasn't armed um, so yeah Sutton Lounge just go to the first floor and then go all the way to the end of the first floor and you'll see signs for it but it is it is difficult to find so <clears throat> Um, I always have to write everything out. I always get nervous about doing introductions and things, so uh, Carl's much better at doing the ad lib. But it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Gwendolyn Mahan, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of New England, to her first faculty symposium at UNE. She joined UNE with immense experience over a 24 year span at Rutgers University, where she served in multiple roles including Dean of the Rutgers School of Health Professions, Assistant Dean for Research at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, and Director of Cancer Research Program Development and Planning at the New Jersey Medical School University Hospital Cancer Center. As a first-generation college student, Gwen is passionate about helping others access the opportunities that higher education has provided her, and has a keen understanding of the importance of a student-centered philosophy and community-engaged approach in higher education. I want to thank Dr. Mahan for taking the time out of her busy schedule to open our proceedings today. And I know she already said she wishes she could be here all day, but she's a provost. So. <laughs> all right. Good morning, everybody. And it is true. I, re I looked at this, and I would really love to be with you here all day. I'm going to sneak in and out when I can. but. Unfortunately, end of the semester, and I have packed with meetings today, but I'll be with you in spirit. So it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you, colleagues from UNE and colleagues from University of Southern Maine, to our seventh annual faculty symposium sponsored by the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. This symposium is a time to recognize and celebrate our accomplishments over the past year, and to renew, refresh, and revitalize our curiosity and quest for teaching excellence. I'm going to take a little brief break here because I see Dr. Mike Sheldon has entered uh, the room. And just for those of you who do not know Mike, 
Um, in addition to serving as Associate Provost for Academic Affairs, and it's also a very busy time of year for him, he's the advisor to the fishing club. <laughs> and the reason I am pointing him out is, it was supposed he was supposed to be at a meeting earlier, but I saw him out the window in his fishing gear in my <laughs> office, so I'd like an update. Did you catch a fish? All right, one fish caught. <laughs> So, um, so I want to take a moment to appreciate your remarkable contributions to this institution over the past year. We can now finally say that the COVID-19 pandemic is over. I think that brings a round of applause, right? <laughs> your continued flexible response, adapting teaching to the mental health concerns and educational needs of our students, and to ensure their academic success has been nothing short of heroic. Your active engagement in the recent revision of our university strategic plan has given it new life, showing that we are a community that evolves together, always striving for improvement. And you have done all of this while meeting changes to accreditation standards, undertaking curricular revisions, you know, we have a big one going on with the core curriculum, and continuing a robust program of scholarship. I'd like to extend a special thanks to the CETL Advisory Committee especially Jennifer Stiegler Balfour. Where are you here? Can you stand up? There she is, back there. Who's chair of the committee for their exceptional work in organizing this symposium. Their meticulous planning, theme selection, keynote speaker recruitment, and proposal vetting have been instrumental in setting up this conference. It goes without mention that this conference would not be possible without the hard work and dedication of Carl and Mark, whom I would also like to thank for their professional support assisting faculty in their teaching, support of students, scholarship of teaching and learning, and general welfare. And personally, I love our conversations. I, I don't get to be in the classroom much anymore, and it really gives me a chance to talk about what's going on. So thank you. I would also like to thank our facility support staff for post postponing repairs to the elevator <laughs> so we can more easily get to our breakout sessions this afternoon. And lastly, I would like to express my appreciation to Zachary Newell, Dean of Libraries and Learning. Is Zachary in here? There he is. Hi, Zachary. University of Southern Maine for creating a collaborative environment and extending this conference to their university University, a collaboration we look forward to deepening and strengthening in the years to come. Thank you, Zachary. I will now return the microphone to Mark Everfield, who will introduce the keynote speaker. All right, is that, is that, that good? All right, so it is an honor to introduce the distinguished speaker for today's faculty symposium, Dr. Robin DeRosa. Dr. DeRosa is a vanguard of open pedagogy, an advocate for public institutions of higher education, and a champion of innovative teaching and learning approaches. I wrote this really, really long introduction, and I see we actually, we're, you know, we, we've got time, we've got like seven minutes. She doesn't really want me to. I've admired her work for, for a long time, because that's the first time I've met her, but I, um, she, as I will say, she's got a website that has just amazing um, keynotes and presentations that she's done, and most of her work, she's an advocate for open educational resources, and most of her work is, is open educational resources, and she keeps her, and so this is being, she said, please do tape it, right, and make it available, so this will be made available as well, and I can't wait to hear what she's gonna say. But I think it's important that you get a little background, so I am gonna read a bit of it, <laughs> so. Um, Robin was an English professor for 15 years before she moved into the field of interdisciplinary studies and helped develop a radically student-centered pedagogy for Plymouth State's customized major program. As the new director of the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative, Robin was excited to work with students, faculty, staff, and administrative colleagues on exploring learner-driven architectures for projects, courses, partnerships, and programs at Plymouth State University. Though she now works with students and faculty across a wide variety of disciplines, she still finds that she relies heavily on her humanities training to help her think critically about the future of higher education and the ways that we can work together to help make academic scholarship more relevant and accessible to the public. She's a prolific writer. I strongly recommend you visit her website where you can find links to most of her works as well as her presentations. She's published several open access books, including Open at the Margins, Critical Perspectives on Open Education, 
and her most recent, an open access textbook titled Interdisciplinary Studies, a Connected Learning Approach. She's been featured at keynote, she's been a featured keynote at national conferences and numerous regional and institutional events. Um, in this presentation, Openness, Equity, and Teaching Towards Our Lodestar, Dr. DeRosa will start from the premise that the stories we tell about education, about what makes it effective and rigorous and good, that these stories have shaped our practices in ways that often defeat our deepest aspirations. And I'll leave it there, and I can't wait to hear what she has to say. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Can this is good volume? Mm -hmm. um, and hi to everybody online. Um, I just want to say I'm so grateful for the live stream um, because if if we are in a post-COVID moment, I think it's not so much uh, after COVID, but since COVID is the way I think about about post-COVID. Um, that many of us are still uh, dealing, and I I have tried really hard um, not to accept any speaking engagements that don't have a live stream um, attached just so that folks who are immunocompromised or for other reasons uh, can't necessarily be safe in the large space um, have the opportunity. So I'm really glad that you're there and I hope if there are folks watching the Zoom, you'll let me know if anything pops out or if there's anything we need to know about, um, just let me know. I'm really glad to be here uh, talking with all of you um, at UNE and USM and I see that the library director, has he just stepped out for a second? Um, now I'm going to have to pick on him while he's not even in the room, it seems in poor taste. Um, but his predecessor, uh, David Nutty, um, it, so actually my new position at Plymouth State is Director of Libraries and Learning because I was, I was convinced that if I changed the title, um, I could be more like David Nutty. And so that's my, my goal. He's, a, he's been a, a wonderful, uh, far off mentor to me. And some of you from USM may rem remember me from a few years ago when I unsuccessfully applied for a rather large position at your institution. So at the end of this presentation, you might be going, oh, thank God, you know, that, that was close. Um, and I, I absolutely love where I am at Plymouth, but I just had such a fondness for, for USM and some of the work you guys have done there. So uh, it's really an honor to be here and happy to be talking with you. Um, I am going to start with some stuff that you may not really feel like thinking about right now as the summer is dawning. Um, but I, I do want to contextualize some of what I'm talking about with the moment that we are in, which is still so colored by what we've gone through. I think particularly those of us who work in faculty development, um, we are still reeling from the challenges that our, of trying to support our faculty through what's happened in the last couple years. And so I will take you back to a time that you remember well. Um, March 11th was the date that the WHO declared the uh, global pandemic. And I want to start with a, a quick interactive, if, if this you know, makes you, uh, it, you know, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. Um, but if you go to slido.com and stick in that code, you'll be able to interact. You can use the QR code with your camera if you want. I want you to think about this question. What risks became apparent or more apparent to you when COVID entered our lives. So when you think of the, of the word risk, um, there was a lot of risk during COVID. What were the risks that really popped up either for you personally or you in your professional work? Uh, teacher, librarian, instructional designer, dean, whatever it is that you do. What risks um, came up to you? And, and you'll see they'll start populating there. It's always exciting when it actually works. Sometimes it does. Um, yeah, so we're seeing, uh, I don't know how folks at home are, are experiencing this. Um, it's really interesting to see the, the middle one, social isolation um, being so large, job loss, uh, mortality. Um, I kind of hate to say this at the beginning of your summer faculty development event, but we are going to talk about mortality in the next couple of slides. Uh, safety, mental health, immunocompromised friends, uh, personal health, fragility of community, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, elderly parents, um, my mom had uh, a stroke many, many years ago and uh, about a week ago she had some seizures, uh, 
that it turns out are connected to old stroke. I know there's a lot of um, healthcare folks here. Um, you guys have strong nursing programs and such. So apparently this is a thing that happens. So I've been caring for my mom for the last week and it was a big issue actually thinking about coming here and then going back to care for my mom, right? Do I need a little quarantine period? Where are we, we, we with things? Um, this is probably the first event I've been at where I have not put on a mask. So, you know, there's a lot of things. Those risks are in my head all the time as I'm talking with you here. So I just want you to think about the kinds of things that you're seeing on this screen because we're going to keep going. You can keep putting stuff. It'll populate. And I will share the slide deck with you guys later um, so that you, it's openly licensed. You can take whatever's helpful, but you can also browse some of those in more depth. Um, so a day later, this was a headline, uh, U.S. colleges moved classes online, right? Uh, for many of us, we had about three days to do what's called the pivot, right? The pivot online. It's so delicate sounding for what actually happened. Um, but yeah, we, we, we did the pivot pretty quickly. Um, and I want you to look at the date of this, right? So the pivot around March 12th. Um, and then March 16th, Inside Higher Ed ran this article. Ed tech vendors confront sudden opportunity and risk. With the coronavirus outbreak forcing colleges to close, campuses and move classes online, vendors face sudden upside, which is just not a word I feel like I wanted to see in a headline on March 16th, 2020. Like, what an upside, right? Uh, the biggest beneficiaries are likely different in the long and short terms. This article was about um, for-profit uh, education companies, um, some in, in particular uh, OPMs, online program managements, that kind of sell colleges, big packages of online learning. Sometimes you don't even need faculty, right? They'll sell you that too as part of the package. Um, but I just, I want to remember that slide where we looked at risks because what the Inside Higher Ed article was about was about the opportunities and risks for these ed tech vendors. So check out this article. Um, I think the date is the 23rd. Um, amid novel coronavirus outbreak, for-profit education stocks are expected to gain manifold as online educators are viewing shutdowns as an opportunity to increase its re risk reach among students. In fact, many online players are also striving to reach students who aspire to complete their courses as planned with the help of various online platforms. And then it's the tone of this last paragraph that kind of gets to me. On March 11th, the World Health Organization declared the novel coronavirus a global pandemic during a press conference in Geneva. The virus is spreading so vigorously, it's infected more than 340,000 people. 50,000 people? March of the, it's like, there's almost this jubilation, like, do you know what the Zoom stocks are going to do now? <laughs> right? Um, you know, and I don't necessarily fault um, anyone their capitalism, although, you know, privately I do. But, you know, the big keynotes, I, I try to toe the line a little. It's more, um, it's more the fact that when we're talking about educational opportunities and risks, it really matters that we ask, whose opportunity and whose risk when we're trying to analyze these things. Um, and that's a little bit what I want to talk about today. So I said we talked about mortality. I'm, I'm putting this, the, the sad stuff at the front, right? The happier stuff comes later. Um, so I started thinking about opportunity and risk. And this was a chart um, that really kind of freaked me out when I first saw it, right? It's, it's when you're looking at the early returns on coronavirus and you're seeing the way that it affects life averages um, in the United States. And between 2019 and 2021, non-Latino whites lost two years on average, while non-Latino blacks lost 3.5 years and Latinos lost 3.7 years of life expectancy. It's a little different than the risk for the stock market when we're looking at the risks to mortality. And of course, the other thing we're looking at here, because we'll be talking, of course, about equity, is how those risks compound depending on your identity and who you might be. Um, so again, I'm thinking about all the charts and the graphs and what the data looks like. Um, I don't know about you, but in higher ed right now, and I'm in a teaching and learning center, we spend a lot of time on 
data and assessment, right? Everything needs to be a data-driven decision, right? Um, and I, I can't, I almost can't say it any other way than data driven. Like there's such sarcasm dripping from me because the stories we tell with data are stories, right? Data that's decontextualized from a story means nothing, right? So we're, it's all a question of what we do with the graphs and the charts and the lines that we have. So that's what I started asking, right? When, when you're looking at these charts and graphs from an ed tech perspective, is very different than when you're looking at them from a perspective of someone who's caring for an elderly parent, say. Um, and so I started thinking about these, these data graphs a little bit like we think about stars, where you know the stars in the sky, it, they're, they're infinite. The data is infinite, right? I mean, there is, there is no end to the data that you can collect. Some of you know this because you're doing accreditation, self-studies, whatever, there is literally no end to the data that you can collect. Um, but what happens to the data is that we put it into stories, and I think about those kind of the way we think about constellations in the sky. So even though there's an infinite number of stars, you know, you put it into something like Orion's belt, and it, it makes sense to you now, you're right? You're able to find it, you're able to communicate about it with somebody else. Um, this is a great quote by Rebecca Solna that I love. Um, she says, the stars were given and the constellations we make. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the, the launching pad for what I want to talk about today is how we take all of the data that's flying at us um, and all of the challenges that we're experiencing in higher ed. Um, the coronavirus is just one part of that, but what I think that COVID did is that it um, illuminated those challenges, almost like, a, like an MRI die or something, right? That you were able to, to see um, those challenges in, uh, in a sort of iridescent way after, after or since COVID. Um, so I wanna think about how we tell these stories and how we make sense of that data and how we use the data to tell the stories of the people that we really build education for, right? Who's opportunity? Who's risk? When you measure what you want to be doing in your job, who are you doing it for? My, my friend, uh, the poet at Plymouth State, her name's um, Liz All. she's a truly fantastic poet. She has a great story that she tells that she put into a poem about being at a truck stop in the middle of the night, one of those young cross-country trips that we used to take in the old days. And, um, she was sitting at the truck stop, you know, eating her ham and eggs or whatever, and some trucker came in and said to her, who do you drive for? Assuming that, you know, who else would be here in the middle of the night but a trucker? And she used that, like, in, in, in her poem, uh, the answer was Walt Whitman, that's who she drives for, uh, with her head out the window, sounding her barbaric yacht across the United States. Um, but it's also a, a call I've been using as I think about who, who are we driving for, right? probably not the ed tech industry and the stock market that follows, follows it, but who are we driving for in the daily work that we do, and are we designing our courses and experiences in a way that align with why we're on that road, right? Um, so I wanna tell a few stories, I'm gonna share a few stories actually, from uh, when COVID hit, we started at Plymouth State, applied for a, a thing called a FAST Fund. It comes out of um, the Hope Center in, at Temple University, and they did a lot, of, uh, a lot of studies that showed that fast money to students who need it in small dollar amounts makes a significant impact on students' ability to complete college. And small dollar amounts, I'm talking about anywhere from like 50 to $300. Um, to a student in crisis can be the difference between dropping out and not. So we applied for $5,000 from the FAST Fund that we could give out at Plymouth State right when COVID hit and people were um, quickly falling into challenges. We gave out all the money in one day because we had so many applications just, just flooded. And on the application, they could ask for as much or as little as they wanted. It was really shocking to see how many people asked for $45, $80, and oftentimes said, like, I could use a lot more, 
but I, I know you probably don't have unlimited amounts, so if you could just give me $40, I could blah, 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 blah. So with that $5,000, I can't remember, but I want to say we gave out about 85 small dollar amounts, and the, you know, there, there was nothing about how you thank us. People found ways to send those, those thank you notes. These are from some of the applications um, that, that folks sent in with a few things um, shifted here and there to um, protect the stories. My father and I uh, are both out of work as of right now because our jobs closed down and we're having trouble feeding my four-year-old brother. With his daycare being closed, my dad's asked me to come home and babysit him while he hunts for jobs. We do not have access to Wi-Fi at our home, making it hard for me to focus on my studies to the best of my ability. This money can help my father and I gain Wi-Fi access and put food on the table. Um, this probably happened for you guys too because you're both um, residential campuses and you both serve rural communities. Um, challenge during the emergency remote pivot because you realized how many of your students maybe didn't have reliable network um, or sometimes even the devices that they needed. Um, so again, I thought, well, it's funny when you grasp this out, right? It's not like those mortality things. Uh, this is a complex constellation, right? It's, it's a story with a lot of moving parts, right? The kids in daycare, the dads there, the, the Wi-Fi. And a lot of people would say, like, people can't eat. You need Wi-Fi, right? No, like, he needed Wi-Fi. That was college. And what happens if you drop out of college with the student loan debt that you have, right? I mean, there's so many challenges. Um, and the stories are complex. Uh, here's another one. My brother's currently going through cancer. My parents are struggling to get my rent payment in at the moment due to the coronavirus affecting their jobs. I signed my lease anticipating being here for the year. Now I have to pay my rent for a house that I don't even live in. Thank you for looking into my situation and providing any possible help. Um, and another, I'm a self-supporting student. I have no home other than Plymouth State because my family's abusive. I even have to support my mother financially out of my own pocket so she can survive. I need help to cover the cost of food and hygiene products. That, that was a, a big issue too, you know, not just Tampax and whatever else, but also, you know, people were like, do I need hand sanitizer? Like you say, sterilize these things, like every little thing, right, was, was a challenge. Um, when Res Life said, it's time to move out, there were students who said, this is where I live. You know, this is my home. I don't have another place to go to, right? I have no other alternative. Um, I don't want to be kicked out of school because I'll be in serious mental and physical danger. So this was the kind of stuff I was reading at the same time as I was reading the jubilant article about the opportunities that were going to come to the private market through coronavirus. And again, you know, there's a certain kind of social entrepreneurship that says it would be the best if we could you know make the markets work and get what it they need while we're also keeping people healthy and safe but my concern is that sometimes these things do not align and i really wanted to know what are we going to do moving forward that keeps me focused on these stories and how these stories are affected um, and how these stories affect what i do every day so I really wanted to think about how do I build a story with data like that, not just qualitative data, which is nice, you know, I lean towards the humanities, so the qualitative data is important, um, but really the question is the why, right? You're providing this data, but for what and for who? Um, what's the purpose of what we're doing here? So I'm going to move this to talking about open education, which is probably the thing I'm most known for talking about. Um, but I'm going to contextualize the conversation about OER in a different way than maybe you've heard before. So um, we'll talk about open educational resources. Some of there may be a, a few in here who don't even know what that is. Um, but for those who, who know a lot about OER, I'm going to try to contextualize that in a larger story, a larger narrative about what we're doing here and why. And I'm gonna start with this chart, which made such a difference to me as a faculty member. Because I will say as a faculty member and someone who's generally concerned with equity and teaching, I had always thought about the cost of my books. Now, I was an English professor, so our books are not known for being, you know, as exorbitant as say, like, God help you if you teach anatomy and physiology and you haven't looked at OER, right? Um, and also some things in, in OER, uh, in English, can't be OER, right? Like you teach a modern poet, 
go buy the damn book. Like, that's fine, right? It's, it comes from some press, and you're not going to openly license someone's creative property. When we're talking about OER, we're talking about stuff that is written for students for learning, right? We're not talking about books in general. Um, but this chart got me realizing, like, oh, maybe it's not enough to just like look at two copies of Jane Austen and get the cheaper ones, say. Maybe I need to be taking this a little more seriously. Um, this is from the two, uh, 2016 version of the Florida Virtual Campus Study. They did it twice. Uh, the other one, I think, was in 2018. Massive studies, uh, over, I think, around 25,000 students in each cohort. Um, and it shows the effect of textbook costs on what we sort of conventionally call student success. Um, and this is where I started realizing, like, it's really not about textbook costs. It's really about the right of students to access college, you know, and complete college and succeed in college, right? Um, so in this study, about half of all students were reporting, for example, taking fewer courses simply because the textbooks were too expensive. Um, that's the bar that gets most administrators perking up because, of course, when you take fewer credits, you take longer to, gra uh, to graduate. When you extend the time to graduation, you decrease the chances that you actually will graduate. So if you've ever heard anybody on your campus talk about retention or persistence, and I'm guessing you have, um, that would be the, the, the data bar right there that, that gets the retention people concerned. Um, students are also not registering for specific courses. Almost half of all students say, I didn't choose this course because it was too expensive. This has a big issue. Um, one of the ways I got the biologists on my campus on board with OER, because I have to say, in general, they were too consumed with like, especially horseshoe crabs for some reason, which they were raising up in giant tanks and they were so excited about them and I could never get them to pay attention um, until we did a little survey and we found out that lots of students were not selecting the biology major because of the cost of the biology textbooks, which are expensive. Um, once they realized it was hitting them in the bottom line, which is uh, enrollments in majors, which is one of the little data points that we tend to toss around a lot about whether your program is going to stay open or closed. I think it's a problematic metric, personally. But uh, it, got, it got the biologists thinking. And um, they switched almost everything, except for the chemistry courses in the biology degree, because they can't get the chemists on board yet. Um, but everything else is, is OER in that major because they found that students were specifically avoiding them. Um, but the ones in the middle are really where we get to what we call the throughput rates, right? Drops, fails, withdrawals, all of these things radically impacted just by the cost of textbooks, where a quarter of students are dropping a class just because they can't afford the books, 37% uh, earning a poor grade because they can't afford the books, 20% failing because they couldn't afford the books, and of course that one on the end is no surprise to any faculty member. Um, that at least uh, two-thirds of students are basically not buying a required textbook because it's too much money. You see them, especially the first couple weeks of the semester, they're sitting there, they say, I'm waiting for my check to come in, I'll get it in a couple weeks, I'm borrowing John's book, or I'm going to try to get it at the library, or I have an old edition, it's not exactly right, but it's close. Um, and a lot of times these are some of the students um, who are underserved in education, and more vulnerable to already dropping out of college. So they start with, say, a two-week lag because they don't have their books setting themselves even further back. So this is one of the things that got me realizing you don't have to be excited, number one, about textbooks, because most of us aren't, <laughs> or number two, about costs. What you have to be excited about is the chances that your students have of making it successfully through your class. And once you care about that, we pay attention to textbook costs. Um, I don't know if this thing, yeah. So this is one of the charts um, that, that uh, kind of proves, I think. Um, actually, The Economist cited this chart and called it, quote, a textbook price, or a textbook example of price gouging. So you, you know when The Economist makes a pun, it's really bad news. Um, and you can see that right up there with like hospital services, where they are charging you like $60 for a Tylenol, you know, because the, of the markup. Um, we have a similar thing happening. There is huge money being made in the textbook industry. So um, it's just not being made, number one, by textbook authors, right? And it's uh, certainly not being made by um, 
students and, and families, right? It's being made by uh, the textbook companies, particularly the, the big three, sometimes big four, depending on how you do it, because it's a monopolized um, industry. So you can see here uh, one of the big three, Cengage, um, his C the CEO of Cengage in 2018 quoted as saying, there's millions of students out there making very painful trade-offs in the purchase of learning materials relative to paying the rent or paying ba for basic needs. You can follow textbook broke um, if you're still on Twitter or, uh, you know, sadly if you're still on Twitter or you can come over to Mastodon, we'd have to get it, get it going there. Uh, but textbook broke tells the story of students who have to make difficult trade-offs when they're choosing between things like books and, and, and paying for food. Um, so of course, the textbook companies came up with some solutions. Um, so thank you, Michael Hansen, for recognizing that the problem that you caused is causing students to go hungry, and you're gonna you're gonna fix it. Um, so they fix it with things like inclusive access or automatic textbook billing. Um, at the University System of New Hampshire, where I am, we got a grant to do an OER program, and one of our administrators tried to use that grant money to pay Barnes and Noble for an automatic textbook billing um, program because the words that they use to describe these programs make you think that they're open education initiatives. Things like inclusive access. Like those are literally my two words, inclusion and access, right? And they put it on um, some programs that are really kind of in many ways the opposite of open education. There is a great, website, and I want to say it's just inclusiveaccess.org, and I think it's org, inclusiveaccess.org, that will explain to you why these programs um, are, in fact, not the same as open education. I really would never say don't ever use them, because everything's case specific, and what we're trying to do is make college more accessible. So in some cases, in your particular situation, there may be reasons, but in general, it's important to make sure you understand the downside, um, especially with limiting academic freedom and increasing the monopolization of the textbook industry. The more powerful these three monopolized, um, you know, Pearson and Cengage, the, the, the bigger that they get, the harder it is for you to secure materials for your students that come from outside those conglomerates that won't be exorbitant prices. They bundle things together and they charge you extra if you go outside the bundle because they want to keep you using their materials. So it's a real problem for academic freedom. Um, the other thing, of course, that they do is they tie everything to access codes, right? So your students are buying digital codes, digital codes that can't be sold used, that can't be borrowed, um, that can't be lent. These are their workarounds to keep poor students from using some of the access points that they were using that undercut their, their profits before. So there's real um, downsides to these, uh, to these issues. And uh, my friend Rajiv Janghiani, who's an open educator in British Columbia, he says, inclusive access is like leasing a fire extinguisher from a serial arsonist. Um, you know, thank you for the help solving the problem that you are perpetually creating. Um, and then you're going to sell us a solution back to the problem that you made, right? So it's a really elegant little wheel for the textbook industry. Um, one of the questions I had is like, God, you know, all the brain power, like virtually everything we need is in this room, you know? So why, and, and you know, maybe we need some help with, with certain kinds of publishing or this or that. Should we really be siphoning off billions of dollars to these third party things when everything that we need is right here, the, the expertise, the, the, um, the content, the pedagogy, right? It's all right here in this room. So that's some of the stuff I started thinking about is um, how do we use our institutions of higher education, not just to teach our individual classes, but to really be rowing together so that we can be giving society what it needs in order to do learning. Um, another example I want to give is about um, child care. So if you look, there's a, and when you see the slide deck, you can get the links down in the slide notes for everything, but um, we have things called child care deserts, right? They kind of overlap um, in general with 
poverty. So what you can do on this website is you can slide to see where child care, care deserts are, and you can slide to see where high poverty exists. And you'll see that those things overlap and that many, many places in the United States, including your place where we sit right now, um, have some pretty significant child, child care deserts. Um, this may be an issue in faculty and staff recruitment that you may be facing. We certainly are having this problem at Plymouth State where young, like wonderful faculty come. They're going to raise their families in an incredible small town, like where I literally chose to be there because I could raise my family and they can't find any child care, right? People are literally just like, you know, there's warfare to like get the slots at the child care centers. Um, so 10% of all means child care centers, 175 have closed since March 2nd, 2020. Of those 175, 64, those are the different kinds of centers. Um, and the number of licensed child care providers in the state declined by 112 um, from March 2nd to June 7th over uh, in, in COVID times. These have not bounced back. Um, what is bouncing back or, or just bouncing is what we might call big child care, kind of the same way we say big data, right? That what's happening is we're losing a lot of these small independent centers, especially those that would serve rural communities that would come in places where there you know, there wouldn't necessarily be an opportunity um, to make millions of dollars. Um, and, and they are being overrun by um, kinder care, learning care group, and Bright Horizons. Uh, $47.2 billion child care market. So what we're seeing is these, these expanding deserts, also an expanding market that's pulling in millions of dollars, but child care providers, small daycares, child care um, teachers, right, aren't making enough. So I won't make any assumptions about what happened at any of your institutions, because I may or may not have looked up certain things about what programs you offer. But I'll say at Plymouth State, uh, we're a normal school originally, so uh, we train teachers, and early childhood was kind of one of our big ones. And we have, my daughter was raised at our child care center, mostly by students who were studying early child care. Um, we just closed our program a couple of years ago because the industry pays so little money um, that students don't, are afraid they won't be able to pay back their student loans if they pursue that. And as a result, I am now living in a child care desert with a massive state shortage in child care. And my state institution, as a result, does not offer the exact thing that our state needs. So what's weird is like there is not market demand. Like, you know, we, we had declining majors, so we closed our, our program. But we have huge social need for this thing. And there's also this huge billion dollar industry that's chucking around up here, and yet the children are unserved. So when we think about what makes a market, I think it's a much more complicated scenario than if you just do the market analysis to find out if you're gonna have childcare um, students. One of the things that some states are doing is they are you know, working with their legislators to say, how can we, for example, give tuition breaks to students who study child care so that they don't have to worry about the student debt. And, you know, there are solutions, but if you just look at the data, the quickest thing to do to save your institution that's also struggling is to cancel your early childhood program, right? Because um, that's costing faculty and it's not yielding majors. So you can see these education programs as, we, as the child care crisis and the deserts get larger we actually get fewer and fewer programs um, in, our, in our schools, which is it, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense. So part of what I'm suggesting here is that we have to go back to that question. Who's opportunity? Who's risk? What is the institution here for? What is the point of what we're doing? And especially as teachers, right, in the classroom. I think administrators sometimes have to take a slightly different view. So the question I have is, you know, as a teacher, what could I be doing? This is a great report. I encourage you all to look at it. Um, Philip Trostel, does anyone know him? Because he's, he's in Maine. Um, and I've heard him speak before, and I, I cite him all the time. And this is a slightly older report now, but it's absolutely brilliant. It really, um, he's an economist, so people listen to him in a way that they will never listen to me as a literature professor. 
Um, he's an economist and he speaks the language of economics. And he basically breaks it down to show how much um, benefit, and by that he means economic benefit, we all get out of our colleges and universities. And so he's measuring private market benefit. That's the main thing we all measure. That's why we don't have early childhood studies majors, because the private market benefit to them of college is low. When they go to college, they can guarantee they will get a $35,000 a year job when they graduate, right? So that's a low benefit from, you know, at Plum State, you're paying $25,000 a year um, in state. So, but what he measures also is the other, not just private um, market benefits. He looks at private non-market benefits, things like your mortality, how do you say it? your mortality will go up? No, your, your longevity, your life expectancy will go up if you go to college. Also, the life expectancy of your children will go up, whether they go to college or not, right? So the, so the, the non-market benefits are significant. And then he looks at the social benefits, right? You will, if you go, if you live somewhere where more people go to college, there will be more uh, tax revenue. People will be happier. They will have better marriages. You know, there's a whole bunch of things, right, that he measures um, and, and sort of quantifies. I think what's interesting about what Philip Trussell kind of suggests to us is that it's not just the money. And by that, I don't mean like there's other important things in life. Like, it's not all about money. I mean, if you only measure one simple narrative, one simple constellation, you're not going to get the right picture, just like with child care, right? Because at Plum State, we saw there was not an economic benefit to taking in this major, you know, cut it out. Now everybody's scrambling to say, how can we get more child care majors? Well, I don't know. Don't come here because we don't even have a program anymore. The faculty are gone. Like, we don't, we, we couldn't bring it back without a massive, you know, expenditure of resources given what we've now lost. Um, so we have to think in other ways. This is why I like the open education question, because it's not just about free textbooks. It's about thinking, OK, I'm already here teaching. I already got to teach this guy chemistry. How can I think about the architecture of what I'm doing so that I can use my institution to build a more sensible way of creating um, a, a social good, a public good, right? Because we can do that at the same time as we are giving the private benefit of education to that one student. And that's the beauty, I think, of, of OER as a sort of metaphor for a lot of things we could do in our teaching that would think about how we leverage our institutions for the public good as well as the private benefit of our students. So just to, to stick on OER for a minute, there's lots of persuasive evidence. When I first started doing this back in, I don't know, 2015, 16, we didn't have a lot of evidence. We just had a lot of people going like, this seems to make really good sense. Like, why wouldn't we do this? Now we have a lot of evidence. So, um, so first of all, for those of you who are new to OER, uh, basically open educational resources are um, free, openly licensed educational materials. And that's important to note that they're both free, no cost, but they're also free as in the open license, freedom. Um, so the, what they mean is they're still copyrighted, right? If you create an OER, you still own that copyright. But with copyright, normally, if you wanted to use something that was copyrighted to me, you'd have to call me or my publisher, usually pay me some money or get um, something written that says you're allowed to use this. With OER, we put another license on top of the copyright. It's called an open license. And it gives you whatever permissions you want to lay out to go ahead and share and use that material without having to go through all the rigmarole of, of getting permissions. So it's a way of sharing, right? One of the um, fathers, uh, David Wiley, just um, of OER, just basically says education is sharing, right? So it's the, it's the idea of licensing your sharing. Um, for uh, what this means is that these materials are 100% free unless you want to print them because the cost of printing um, is not as easy to make free as a digital resource. So um, you can also print 
OER, and if you do, you can usually print that at cost. So the, the cost of the textbook is whatever it costs you to print it. So a good example of these uh, would be the OpenStax textbooks. Um, that's what our biology program uses at Plymouth State. You really can't tell any difference between an open stacks textbook and any other commercial textbook. They're beautiful, they're bound, they're in color, um, and you know they, they literally look the same. Um, but the open stacks textbook costs um, you know maybe forty dollars to have that beautiful bound version versus um, you know one hundred and ninety dollars say for an average. Uh, bio textbook. Um, the other difference is that it's also online at the same time, so you can access, you know, you can you can have it in both modalities for, for free, so if you're on the bus or whatever, you can pull it up on your phone or, or look at it. Um, we have a lot of data that tells us a lot of things about OER, so the, the two things I'll mention before this one, I'll mention uh, the perception data on OER is pretty persuasive at this point. OER is perceived as the same or better quality both by the students and the faculty who use it. Does this mean every OER? Like, no, you know, sometimes there's a bad one, just like God knows there's a lot of bad commercial textbooks, right? So you still have to do the same things you do as a teacher with any book. You have to look at it first and determine if it works for you, if it's good. You can also um, break up your OER, like there's some OER that's uh, peer reviewed and there's some OER that is not peer reviewed. Just like there's some commercial textbooks that might just be um, created by one person and their publishers, others have big boards of people. So it, it, it's all kind of the same with quality, but the perception studies show, um, and the mantra of OER is same or better, same or better. They almost all show that people think they're the same or better quality, both faculty and students. And then the other kind of data are these outcomes data. Um, that, that's perception data and outcomes data. The outcomes data has been pretty persuasive um, that we are getting some pretty good student success benefits out of switching to OER. This was a great piece. Um, Eddie Watson, you might know from AAC and U, if any of you work with that agency. Eddie um, it does some great work with them. But he and his team found that OER improved end of course grades and decreased drops failure and withdrawal rates for all students, but for students who are traditionally underserved by higher education, those benefits were up to one third more. So in his study in particular, they were looking at students of color, and they found that the students of color in the this, in this study had, um, had one third additional um, benefits on the, on the throughput. So it shows that our most underserved and marginalized students by traditional education are getting, no surprise, the biggest benefits. Some people now are trying to dig into why. How much of this is just because of that first chart I showed you when so many people weren't buying and getting the books, right? You have it and you have it on the first day of class 100% of the time. Um, there's other people though who suggest there are other things that happen and that's some of the stuff that I want to talk about um, as we go forward. Because what I want to talk about is whether there's more here to talk about than just access. Um, access is good, right? But I'm not sure that access is exactly what we're going for. Maybe the name of the report about inclusive access that the student perks put out. Um, they basically said they use the word access um, and, and access is the exact thing that they are denying you most in their, in their programs. Um, so let's talk a little bit about access and about you know what else we might be able to get out of these materials um, because it's true no matter how you slice it you're going to save money with OER um, I have this is kind of what the work I used to do would be just taking institutions putting together initiatives and then watching the piggy bank fill up so at Plymouth State we started our you know we're a tiny school we're pretty pretty similar with um, with UNE um, and we are I think at 1.8 million in savings um, we started with 10 faculty a year and you know in the first year with 10 faculty you know, you're already saving like tens of thousands of dollars right so it adds up really really quickly um, so saving money is important and that's that's important to know sometimes administrators aren't as happy about this but that's direct savings to students and their families right so that's not money that the institution saves that's money that comes right out of students pockets the people who love to hear about this is the admissions folks, right? Because they like to say, oh, come to Plymouth State. You won't spend a dollar if you do a biology degree here, you know, beyond 
whatever you might pay for with, with gen ed or electives. Um, but this is great. It's a little bit transactional though, right? There's nothing super complex. You change to a free book, you save each student, you know, $72, you add it up and there you go. It's great. Um, I don't know that a ton of faculty are going to get overly excited about that because once you do it, it's sort of done. Uh, do people, anyone know who this is? This is Paulo Freira. You, you probably, after I say it, you're like, oh. um, so Paulo Freira is um, the the father of I think the pedagogy that whose heart sort of beats through OER, right? And what he talked about, you may have learned this um, in education classes, right? He talked about the banking model. So I think about that piggy bank, the banking model of education. And in the banking model, you as the teacher basically open up the student's brain and make a deposit, right? Like I'm just putting it in and then the student will show like an ATM machine, they will spit out the answer on the exam and the transaction will be successful. Um, and of course, most of us try not to teach like that very often anymore, right? We have things like HIPs, right? High impact practices, active learning. I don't know, do you have different words here? Sometimes we brand our words. What do you guys like? Active learning, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's funny because you look at your website and you're like, have you any, or whatever, right? Like at USM, we do things differently. You will have internships and experiential learning and just like everybody else, right? <laughs> um, but it's great because, uh, and I just did a workshop on this at Plymouth, and let me tell you, the data bears it out. Like, you know, talk about some winning data. Um, you do win with active learning, even on things just like recall and you know regurgitating at the ATF, right? So, so Frera is one of the, the grandfathers of this uh, move away from the banking model to what he called a problem posing model. Um, so, like at Plymouth State, all of our first year seminars are called tackling a wicked problem, right? And there's a wicked problem that can't be solved. And the students, you know, engage in it, right? And they ask questions and they design their own learning. And it's basically a Freer seminar, right? Um, because the idea here is that that's going to get the students actively moving. It's it's inquiry based, um, and it it gets them motivated to learn. Um, so one of the questions a lot of us have in OER when we started teaching with OER is we noticed that we were getting these really giant learning benefits and we wanted to know is all of it coming from the money or could there also be other benefits from what's happening with what we call the five R's, right, that come with the open license in OER. So these are the, the five R's that the open license permits, right? So obviously you can reuse it, you can redistribute it, you can retain it. That's an important one because a lot of ebooks um, or rentals, right, a lot of our students, I mean, what a horrible models, right? To, I, and I remember doing this even back when I was in college, right? I would sell back every book I had, I, I think sometimes for like like 90 cents, you know, like a, like a $50 book for 90 cents, because you would just take any amount of cash you could get, right, to like pay for the cup of coffee that you wanted to get. Um, but that idea of like not being able to, to hold your materials. I'll tell you my first job out of, um, out of college was a high school English teacher. And man, when I when I moved in to to my new job, I had a bookshelf without a book on it, right? I had I didn't I didn't collect one book at college because I had sold everything back. And man did I miss it when I started teaching high school English. And I was like, ah, like where's my annotated Hamlet, right? Um, so the idea that you can keep those books, right? These are important. But it's the ones in the middle where we really see the R's take off, right? The idea that you could revise a textbook or remix a textbook. Now, sometimes it freaks people out. Like, you wanna revise your physics one textbook? Like, there's laws in physics and you can't just revise it, right? Um, yeah, we get that, right? But some of the projects and pedagogies that we're opening up, so first of all, we understand the beauty of you being able to revise and remix. For example, you might have two textbooks, one of which does a certain thing really well. So you take that chapter, put it in here, and now you've got the perfect book. Instead of making your students buy two really expensive books, you've got just one, it works great. You can also remove, say, the last third of the textbook, because maybe your class doesn't go that far. And then you've got that wonderful thing where the student's like, we used every page of the book, right? We didn't waste anything. 
Uh, so that kind of revision makes sense, but other kinds of revision where faculty, students, scholars are getting involved in the materials, pretty interesting thought. I'll explain why it doesn't have to be super scary. Um, these are some ways that I think about open pedagogy. Uh, open pedagogy is a, um, a field you know, that, that accompanies OER, and depending on who was talking to you, you would get a different definition. I'm gonna actually show you a different definition in a minute. Um, and, and this slide changes also every time I give the presentation because I think of something better. So it's not like a, you know, one thing, just like um, critical pedagogy from Frera is not one thing, right? It, it, it's a whole body of work, it's a discourse. Um, but here's some simple ways that I think about open pedagogy that might explain some of the benefits and also might explain a little bit about who's opportunity and who's risks. Like, what, who are we driving for? What's the point of this? So first of all, I think about striving towards social justice. It's interesting because I was just taking notes at our Board of Trustees meeting in New Hampshire, and they actually said, and the board, like, social justice is socialism, and we can't use that phrase anymore. Like, they, they want to legislate it right out of the curriculum. So I understand in a way that two years ago I could say that and it wasn't controversial, it's now, you know, thank you to scientists, become like sort of a politicized word. Um, so take it as you want, but, but the idea for me really is that um, learners, every learner, should feel full access to education, but should also feel that that education reflects their world and the world that they would like to inhabit. Um, you know, not, not in micro details, um, but the idea that, that everybody should sort of have a voice in, in how our world works. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what this can look like in practice, and I'll use um, some work by Sarah Lambert, who, you know, lots of folks talk about this with open, but I think she really crystallized it. And again, when you get the slide deck, if you like this stuff, you can go look at these articles. Um, but she talks about three kinds of justice that we can particularly think about when we are thinking about an open textbook compared to, say, for example, your um, normal commercial textbook. The opposite of an open textbook I would call a commercial textbook. Um, it is copyrighted, it is closed, um, but the whole point of it is that it has to be those things so that it can make money, right? That's the model. So the social justice principle, uh, redistributive justice, this is the classic um, social justice part of OER, the idea that you can get this knowledge into more people's hands, right? So that's like the main thing we talk about with OER, it, you can get it out there. The other ones I think are more interesting, where cognitive justice um, is the idea that you can develop respect and recognition for cultural and gender difference. The idea here is not just that more people get access to something, but also that we can build materials where people can recognize themselves in those materials. Um, this is important uh, because we know that representation matters, right? That, that recognition matters. Um, but also, it, it's, it's interesting to see what some people have done with this kind of OER, even in things like um, math textbooks, for example, to take all of those word problems and use the kinds of names and scenarios that make sense to whatever, it is, whatever community it is that you are teaching. Because it has the double-edged, um, it's not double-edged sword, it's a double-edged lollipop, that sounds unsanitary. Um, but it has, it has the added benefit, right, of not just being relatable, but also helping to make math something that does feel part of the community that is being represented. Um, the last one I think is sort of trickily called representational justice because it sounds like what I just said, right? I see myself represented. But this is actually the kicker. It means representation like in a political sense, that like I have a voice in this process. So not just that I see myself reflected, but that I actually could see myself affecting this body of knowledge. And what that means is not that we want to say like, oh, you just learned, you know, you're the first law of gravity, like now you're ready to change physics, right? But it means that you are welcoming even introductory students into a field that they feel like they could be a part of and affect as they grow. 
right? So it doesn't mean, oh, say whatever you want about physics and we'll write it into the textbook, but it does mean, hey, you know what? Physicists are actual people. They live on the planet now and they're doing work in physics and you can be one of them. And you can start interacting with those people anytime you want. In fact, the first day you're gonna do that is right now because I'm one of them, I'm not a physicist, but you know what I mean, right? Your, your professor is modeling that, right? You are joining the scholarly community. Um, that's the beauty of the open license, right? The open license says everything is moving. All of our fields are changing and developing and we expect the young scholars who are learning with us today are going to be writing the textbooks of tomorrow. So look at the flexibility of this textbook, learn it, regurgitate it back on the test, but understand that your voice is gonna change what's in this textbook tomorrow. Now remember, I also teach early American literature, literature 1400 to 1800. So people are fond of saying, well that field's not changing very much, right? Just like we say about various fields. But like if you read something from 1950, written about the indigenous people of the peoples of the Americas, it's gonna look really different than if you read something from 1969, 1985, today, right? All of our fields are changing. If you're in computer science, it's changing fast, right? Um, but all of our fields are changing. And that's the exciting thing that we're trying to welcome our students into. Um, the other piece of open pedagogy is that we encourage our learners to drive. Um, this is all about inquiry-based learning to a certain degree. But once we see our fields um, as something where they can see themselves, we also say, okay, so where do you want to go in this field, right? Where does this want to take you? I, I can say to my students, like, I am a literature professor, and I can guarantee that a good chunk of you do not want this job. And also the ones of you who want it are not going to be able to get it because we don't have them anymore, right? So, um, so the question for our students is, where are you trying to drive to, right? Who do you drive for? Um, and then we can help them sort of tailor their, um, their approaches. I, I like to get away from the phrase student-centered, and the only reason I get away from that is because we just use it too much that we don't, we don't even hear it anymore. Like, my classes are student-centered because my students talk in them, you know, like, it's great. I mean, we all do that now, right? So, like, I, I, it's good, and if your students don't talk in your class, God love you, like, you know, go, go to some single things and, and fix that. Um, but for the rest of us, I think we are challenged to maybe say, okay, we, we want to make lifelong learners. Are you actually, like, thematizing that in your class? Are you teaching how to learn? Like, do they know how not just to learn physics, but to be physicists? You know, like, are they, are you engaging them in the, the same kind of inquiry-based process that you use when you are learning new things in your field? God knows if you're in health, it's super important. People always say, well, that's fine for humanities people, but I don't want my doctor to be trained. Yes, you do. Like, my husband just had his knee replaced. The guy was really old who replaced it. But I was hopeful that the old guy who replaced his knee had still been learning about knee stuff, right? So like, everybody needs to enter into their fields, right? And, and, and learn this way. And so we have to teach our students how to become learners in their field. And that's partially about helping them figure out what questions they're interested in, figuring out what they want to know, figuring out, you can't give them all of those things all of the time, right? Otherwise, um, they don't learn to drive. So that, that's a, another piece of how I see open pedagogy. There we go. And the last one is what we've talked about, seeing knowledge as connected and collaborative. So it's a bit of a de-emphasis on content, which can be unnerving because we have 14 weeks, 15, 13, whatever yours is, right? 14 weeks of content, they go with my chapters, you know, I think particularly in STEM fields um, or uh, highly accredited fields, right? You've got things you have to hit, like you got the praxis coming, you got this test. I mean, God knows our nursing program, like, you know, you gotta get an 80, you get a 79.5, you're not a nurse, like for the rest of your life, right? So this is a high stakes stuff based on content. But in order to get the students to be successful, the kinds of nurses you want to hire who are going to excel and become leaders of other nurses, 
they're going to need to enter into a nursing community and learn how to stay current, learn how to learn. So you've got to, at some point, not just be about the content, right, but about being about the process. And the open license is a, is a metaphor for this, right? It says, yes, your textbook is important, but this content, it's, it's, it's moving, right? Everything's moving. And if you're not entering into your field, if you're not going to the conferences, if you're not reading the journals, you know, this is why our nurses are doing posters and presenting and whatever. It's not just to regurgitate the ATM content. It's to show them this is a field and you can be a part of it. Um, there's a couple of other slides in here. I'm not going to go into them now just for the sake of time. But they, uh, they can give you some other sort of ways of thinking about open pedagogy. And I'm going to tell you uh, by way of sort of drawing this to a close um, about some projects in open pedagogy that I think help me answer the question, you know, who do you drive for? Um, I started, uh, I mean, I was teaching English for a long time using the Heath Anthology of American Literature, which is up there. And I went to some, uh, this exact event, basically, about the University System of New Hampshire. And the keynote speaker was Cable Green from Creative Commons. And he talked about this thing called an open license. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh my god, my students are paying $90, which is cheap for a textbook, for the Heath Anthology of American Literature, 1400 to 1800 which is virtually all public domain literature, right? It's all out of copyright. So why are they buying this? It's like the most American thing ever, right? Like, my struggling Pell eligible students will pay $90 for free shit, you know? Um, and I, so I, when I learned about it, I, I took the summer and I got some students and we built a replacement little skeletal replacement for the Heath Anthology uh, by going out and finding public domain versions of Thomas Jefferson or whatever. It's not super easy to do because a lot of Thomas Jefferson writing is copyrighted by editors who have done stuff to it, right? So we had to learn a little bit about copyright. I knew nothing. I had some librarian help. help. Um, and we built a little replacement called the Open Anthology of American Literature. I dumped it into a thing called Pressbooks, which is a free you know, literally, I, we would paste them from one thing into the other. And, um, and we started using the book uh, the next semester. Some of the students over the summer who worked on it were in the class, and we were all like, we're amazing, it's free, there's no cost. And everybody loved it until like this third day, and then people were like, this book sucks, it's terrible. Um, and there were a bunch of reasons for that. The biggest one was like one of the things we read early is Cabeza de Vaca. He's a Spaniard, he's wandering around Florida. And already they're like, where's the pilgrims? Why are we in Florida? Like, what's Hispaniola? <laughs> like, we had, there's no footnotes, there was no maps, there was no pictures, like they, there was, a, you know, nothing. And they, you know, it was a disaster. Um, and that's when, of course, we had the giant aha moment that really changed the trajectory of my life, which was, well, you guys could write this stuff. You're already writing like completely useless research papers that you put into Moodle and then we delete. Why don't you instead put them in this thing? Like the Columbus person could do that like two weeks before we get there and then everybody could read your introduction to Columbus and then we would have it. And maybe you can like do some footnotes and you can do something else. And so Hannah Hounsell wrote an introduction to Columbus. It was way better than the Heath Anthology's um, introduction to Columbus because Hannah knew what they didn't know about Columbus, right? So it, it, she didn't skip by any of the basic information, right? She wrote a really beautiful introduction. Um, this guy, Jonathan, um, was like, well, I, you know, okay, but I could make some fun videos. He was really into Jay Smooth at the time. If you know who he is, he's a YouTuber. And um, he made these very like hyper-edited, two-minute introductions to historical periods. Like, you don't understand the Haitian Revolution? Let me tell you, two minutes. Like, and, and they loved it, it was fantastic. So the textbook just became like, oh my God, we could put anything we want in this thing around these primary sources. I layered in an app called Hypothesis, which um, allowed them to take notes in the sidebar and talk to each other. They started posting GIFs and videos and questions and whatever. Um, at the end of the semester, they had put over, the 18 students, they had put over 10,000 annotations 
into this anthology. There is no way they were annotating the Heath anthology, 10,000 annotations, right? Um, it was really fun, and then, uh, as one does, I stopped teaching that course. For the rest of my career, I switched to a whole other department, and I was heartbroken, because we had the, this project that had been so amazing, but we openly licensed it. Was it good? Not really. Like, I mean, it had, it had the text, and a lot of their stuff was A work, and some of their stuff was C minus work. You know, it was what it was. We never said, like, this is an amazing book, but we said it's a student book. You know, people started to use it because it was free, because it was interesting. Um, my colleague, Abby Good, she forked it, made a copy of it, and her students uh, were, were working on environmental stuff. I'm going to keep going because, because I am. Is that okay? whoever's in charge, because don't we have a little break? Is there a break? Yeah, I'm gonna give you a break. We're just gonna take it out of the next thing. It's a, it's a complicated story, I'm telling you myself. Um, so anyway, long story short, people really started picking this up, and um, the uh, a guy at Graceland University uh, took it and got a big grant from Hewlett, and they are gonna come out with a version of this um, that about 20 academics are working on it, and it's going to replace the Heath Anthology, the Norton um, Anthology of American Lit, the Bedford St. Martins. Um, literally no one will buy those books when this version comes out, and a little bit of my students' work is still going to be in there. Um, it's, and their names will be in there because it's their project, right? They, they made this. Um, was their stuff flawless? No, and it doesn't have to be, right? It, it, no, your first draft of your last book was not flawless, I'll tell you that much, right? Um, and so it, it's fine. It was what it was, and it served a ginormous purpose pedagogically and then also in the field, right? So that was a real game changer for me. There's millions of kinds of open pedagogy projects, right? I couldn't begin to summarize them. Lots of people work with Wikipedia, which sounds really scary, but again, it... it it's the idea that if your students are doing research, you know, we have a massive public open access research database, so they don't need to throw it away, right? They don't need to throw their research away. They can put it here. You don't know how to edit Wikipedia. You're afraid of Wikipedia. You have imposter syndrome. You wouldn't even do Wikipedia in your own field. I know, I'm the same way. WikiEDU is a group, a nonprofit. They will help you. They will, they will create the entire assignment with you for your course, you want to do a two-day editing project, you want to do a full semester project, they will stand right by you, um, help you with the entire thing, teach you all the tech. Um, people do all sorts of things. Like if you're in a technical communication class, maybe you just look at how people communicate and you fix up you know, the, the way they describe something. You're not even doing content research, right? So there's lots of ways that, um, that Wikipedia can be used. Uh, there, NOVA is a psychology uh, professional organization. They have, um, what do you call it, film competitions. So two undergrads won this year. They won a $6,000 prize. But in addition, the little films uh, that people make, those become OERs. They get openly licensed and held on the NOVA website so people can use them in uh, open psychology textbooks, like this one that was written by my friend Rajiv. Um, people complained about the textbook because they still had to use the commercial version because it had question banks and test banks. We're working on that in OER. One of the things Rajiv did is he said, okay, this book doesn't have a question bank. I'm going to take all semester with my students and they're going to write the questions. Um, so I think he had like 20 students and I think they wrote like well over 10,000 questions. Rajiv said it was amazing because they had to come up with plausible wrong answers in addition to the right answers, so they did great. The next semester, those questions went to the graduate students in the program who vetted them, and the semester after that, they went to the computer science undergrads who designed the interface, and now that book has a test bank um, that goes with it that was all uh, student designed. Um, environmental Science Bites, one of my favorite projects out of the Ohio State University, where you've got a regular environmental science textbook, hopefully open source, um, but they create a, a companion guide, which is all about current events in environmental science that match up with the principles from the textbook. So if you think about that, that book never has to end, right? There's always a current event to write about and to apply those theories. Um, you, can, you can read their stuff because students love reading stuff by their peers that's in language they can understand, or your students can write for environmental science bites. 
Um, citizen science, another good example. Um, open climate campaign just started. You don't need to design an open pedagogy project. You can join one, right? That's another way of, of doing it is look, what's, look at what's out there in your field where um, we can have non-disposable assignments where your students are actual contributors learning how to be part of their fields. Here's one I like, Project Squirrel. Um, anybody in Project Squirrel? Um, I think I hit like three or four of them on the way in. I didn't notice if they had tags. I was trying to avoid them, but man, they were aggressively upset or something. Um, so Project Squirrel, where UNE students are um, tagging squirrels, collecting data, and uh, here's another one I like that just came out of USM. Uh, with a walking tour of um, Franco-American uh, sites in, in Lewiston from their library. I think this one's just getting started, and it looks like um, lots of opportunity there for students to be doing projects um, that truly that truly contribute. Um, openpedagogy.org is a site that Rajiv and I founded to basically showcase your good work. So it's time to get Project Squirrel in there and the, um, and the walking tour and anything else that you do. Um, just go in there, submit an example, but also browse in your discipline to see what kinds of things students are doing. So to go, to close it out, to talk about data again, um, I think about this in terms of retention and persistence, which have very you know, technical definitions in the world of you know, enrollment management. But, I remember talking to my students about like, um, what do you what do you think are the problems? Like, why we what's wrong with you know retention and why are the numbers so bad? And we talked for like ten minutes before I realized that the students thought I meant retention. Like, how do you retain information? Because retention is a ridiculous word to students. It has nothing to do with them, right? The students don't retain themselves, right? It's a it's a it's a it's a term that only makes sense from an institutional standpoint. So when I'm thinking about make, you know, doing better for retention at my university, as a teacher, what I'm really thinking about is persistence, right? Students persist. What do you need to keep going? Um, what's going to help you get to, to where you are? Um, and when I'm thinking about the opportunities and risks that I have in, in my daily work, I really want to think of what opportunities are here for my students, for my community, for the public, and what risks are there for my students and our community and this public? And what can I do in my course that's not just going to help that student, but all the reasons that I drive every day, right? Who are you driving for and why? Um, and maybe you, by changing the architectures of your course and thinking more openly and more connectedly, um, you can move the needle not just on giving that one student a good education, um, but also in terms of these larger projects of equity, of retention, um, but also about student need, you know, about uh, community need, right? What is it that your area, your region, your nation need from your institution right now? And how can you be a model for that in the work that you're doing? So a uh, uh, moving Rebecca Solnit quote to end, which I'll ignore. Um, and go to the question period. I feel like I, I tried to throw a lot of different things at you, but the reason is I, I don't think we're in a moment anymore where we can just say like, here's the thing. Like this year, it, it used to be like, this year it's retention. Now it's COVID, now it's online learning. You know, I think we as teachers in particular need to be a little more nuanced because humans don't really work that way. We have complex lives with complex needs, and the best thing we can do, I think, is to um, is to keep the human at the at the center of our institutional designs. And your course is where that starts, I think. Um, I think we will do a break, and then I will come back to answer a few questions. Um, sorry to run over, but I really didn't know how, I, I try to time, I don't know how you time it, I, I just, I'm just not developed that skill, so. Um, so break time, now. So people at home will know how much time, we'll do 10 minutes, um, so we'll come back at 11.20, um, so that's a little over 10 minutes, so 11.20 is when we get started again. Perfect.
just come on back. We'll roll into the questions um, for the question session. And I'll, and I'll do it just because. Remember to use the microphones on your table, hold and chat, and that'll make it easier for everybody online and stuff to hear. Now I'm the only thing between you and lunch. Um, so yeah, I you know it, it's always maybe hard to think about questions, but I just want to say um, I'm happy to be at any level, super macro, but also if you saw a little something and you want to know like how did you do that or what's the specific techie thing or whatever. We can get very micro. I think there's time for all of that, so whatever you want. So I'll, I'll do my best to call and um, and do use the mics. <coughs> Hello. Okay. Um, so in our program, our students all magically have some version of the textbooks in a PDF. And a shared file. I try not to ask a lot of questions because I'm like 99% sure they're breaking the law. Um, I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, that's a yes. I mean, we yeah. So I think that I understand that that's not open in the sense that the copyright isn't really open, which they don't care about. Um, but I guess that has a similar feel to open textbooks because they have the textbooks and they have them online, but it doesn't have all of the same benefits of like remixing and like our, yeah, they have all of our books, yeah. Yeah, so like any comment on that? Do your, are your students also doing that? Um, yeah, so I definitely have comment on that. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean all of our, all of our students are, are also pirating all of the things, right? You know, <laughs> FYI. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a sci hubber at heart, if you know what that is. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of the people who maybe encourages all piracy because I think the greatest pirating is happening in the, in the textbook industry itself. Um, that, so I got no problem with whatever it is you all are doing. Um, you know, it's, a, it's more unnerving to say that to people in Zoom because it's like, could be anyone, and, you know. And yet I trust all of you intimately who are here in the room. Um, but here's what I want to say about, and this is maybe will help explain what I think I'm doing in my, my keynote, is like the problem with that model is it, it, it's good for those students, but it's not pushing the needle on this otherwise like very broken system. So I like the idea as best we can. And, and a lot of like the, the work I do now, I've definitely pivoted from OER into uh, the low cost, no cost terminology <coughs> because there isn't a one size fits all for everything. And, and also sometimes you actually need to purchase a commercial textbook. Like you do, I mean you have to, pedagogically sometimes that has to happen whether there isn't the right thing or just fits too perfectly. Um, you know, so uh, there's no one-stop shop, but in general, I think that when you use open and you call attention to it with your students, you get two benefits. One is you get the benefit of helping them understand knowledge as something that is constantly evolving thanks to a field of people working on, on difficult, you know, challenges and questions, which is a very healthy way to think about academia, I think, as a, you know, opposed to, you know, just one guy going in a room and coming out with all the answers. Like, that's just not how it works, even though sometimes the certain sages on certain stages will tell you, like, that's how it is. All scholarship is a product of collaboration. I like thinking about <coughs> the open license in concert with teaching about citation, right? That citation is about making visible the scholarly community that has helped produce your work because your work has come from a body of work before it, right? So all of this is a healthy way, I think, of thinking about academia, and it also can help us. And you know, who are who are my librarians in the mix here? I know there must be some. Yeah. So the other thing is, like, we're only touching a tiny tip of the broken iceberg when we are talking about OER because. 
Um, we can also be talking in this ecosystem, this big thing I'm trying to move towards, moving our institutions into healthier positions, is also about open access to scholarship. So librarians know this well. Um, open access is less about the learning materials that our students use and more about the scholarly output that we make as scholars. And when we publish something, most of the time it's going in a paywalled journal. Um, that our public can't afford to access. They cannot afford to read it. Many of your students can't afford to read it either because your library can't afford to pay for access to all the databases that it wants. Even Harvard University recently came out and said they can no longer afford access to all of the databases that Harvard University would like to access. Um, at Plymouth State, where like if I want $400 for something, it's like getting blood out of a stone, right? Um, we pay five, over $500,000 every year for access to scholarly databases. Most faculty would be horrified. So on the one hand, with scholarly databases, I say, of course you want your students to use them. God knows what they're paying for, right, for them. Like, it's, it, at Plymouth State, it's all in their tuition. That's how we pay for all of that, because we're only 8% funded by the state of New Hampshire. So tuition dollars are paying for that. So yes, they should use it. But it's really important that people understand that those materials and those databases are not free. They are paying so much money for the work that their own professors did and didn't get paid for in the first place, right? So we have a lot of broken systems. So I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone. Number one, get it into the hands of my students is number one. PDF, whatever it takes, I don't care. But number two, is there a way you can inch towards open in all of your practices? so that we can start fixing this on a more systemic level. That means librarians having a plan for moving towards open access, joint consortia that will help you do that. Just at, like one of the things I'm doing as a director of the library now is um, I'm having a meeting with all the money people at my institution to explain to them how library budgeting works this summer. Because they don't get it, right? They don't understand. They, they say things like, um, why don't you just get the ebook? It'll be cheaper. And I'm like, <laughs> Like that's ridiculous. Like if you know anything about academic publishing, that's 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 kind of nuts, right? Um, this this all happened in Vermont when the Vermont State Library said, you know, we're all going to close and become a digital library. Like it just, it, it, you know, it it was a dumpster fire, and they had to roll it all back. But it was partially because people don't understand um, how academic publishing works. So that's the main thing I would say is like you do what you got to do. So that's, like I kind of applaud you for thinking about making it accessible and free. Or whoever did it with a secret. <laughs> not, not <laughs> students, yes. And that's the thing, like the students will make these workarounds, and that's exactly why those access codes exist, right? Is to prevent those kinds of creative workarounds. Um, because if you need an access code that you know is, is mapped to your identity, you can't get the PDF anymore off of the um, off of the shared drive. So, so that's what I would say. Like, do what you got to do for the workarounds. Support your students in their workarounds as best you can. Um, but the open license is a systemic solution to a systemic problem. Um, and so, it's better than the workarounds when you can move towards open, in my opinion. Um, I think there was a question back here first. There was somebody standing there, but they moved. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll just, I'm going to forget the guy who's standing. Was that you? I've got one. I'm, whoops. Okay, I know they're all over. I'm so bad at this. I'm sorry, guys. At least you guys don't have those um, foam microphones that they throw at your heads when you see those. <laughs> oh, they're horrible. They, they give me nightmares, so. I've, I've got one from the online. Okay, yeah. Um, given your thoughts on OERs like OpenStax, Wikipedia, and Student Centered Documents, what are your thoughts about uh, AI or ChatGPT as tools for educators or learners? I would think language processing models are especially relevant in literature and writing classes as well. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, and I just, I just sponsored a, um, a thing where we talked about this, you know, I had experts, not myself, <laughs> talking about it, and um, I, it, it kind of boggles my mind. Um, so I don't really have a, 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 nobody has a very good answer, I think, to that question yet. Um, a couple of things I will say, and I and I have used chat GPT quite a, quite a bit already, to, you know, getting my, my sense of what it's capable of. 
It does brilliant things like ask it to write a bio of you if you're even remotely public with your work because it wrote an incredible bio about me. I mean, I love myself. It was like, <laughs> it was like the Robin I wish I were. <laughs> and it was like kind of right on, except then it just had things like she's the author of it. It was like make up a book. And it, it's, it doesn't do that. It's not supposed to make things up, you know? So like it, it was weirdly like more me than I am, you know? So like, I don't know. So it, it, you should know what you're, you know, you should get in there probably. Um, if you don't, I'm also on Yik Yak, another embarrassing thing about myself is an anonymous app that sort of flourishes on campuses. I'll tell you like all of your students are, many of your students are using ChatGPT already um, to, you know, I don't know, cheat, learn, both. I guess this is what I would say about it right now is um, I am increasingly convinced that humanity matters. Um, it's really interesting. I used to teach a course, it was on simulacra, it was called the real world in quotes. Um, and it was about um, you know simulated realities, like we were talking about earlier with someone's second life and all that stuff, right? Um, and I think as someone who's interested in that stuff, I, when I was teaching that, we used to read poems that were generated by the computer. And lots of times they were like pretty damn interesting and good. The problem was once you knew that they were written by a machine, it was hard to care about them. Like I would say, analyze this, and it's like, it's a machine, you know? It was hard to feel moved. And it occurs to me that I feel the same way, like about a piece of writing right now, like I care if it's written by a machine or a person. I also care if, if, I'm, if I'm getting advised by a machine or a person, right? This is a big thing in college advising now, right, is that um, apps will nudge, cajole, um, comfort, you know, all sorts of things. Your students, you can purchase these, right? And AI will assist them. Um, same thing when I'm on a bank and I'm chatting with someone because something's wrong and it's like, I, I like people and humanness. So one of the questions I have is like, why do we want these things to, you know, and, and some of it I understand, like for example, I had to write a, a giant accreditation thing recently and I was like, I chat GPT, do that shit. Like, <laughs> why would I? So I, I guess what I feel like is, um, it, it's coming, it's here, it's already doing lots of things and soon it will do way more things. And the question I just wanna keep asking is, what is, what is lost? when we lose humans from different things. And that's the question I would just put to it, like with my students, with whatever, like if you were to do this with ChatGPT versus do it yourself, what is lost and what is gained? And you know, if, if the loss is a problem, like then we should not be doing it. You know, if, if the gain is helpful, then fine. Um, but I think we don't talk about, it's kind of like when we're measuring the value of college or the value of a, of a child care, childhood studies program. You can't just look at one metric. You can't just look at what's faster. You can't, you know, like again, I produced this incredible bio about myself, but there were lies in it, you know? Like there were things that were wrong. And so I, I, I think that's the issue is like, you have to have a very full analysis and I would encourage you to do that with your students, not for them, you know, like have the conversation. When you, when you do this with a tool versus not a tool, and it's kind of a similar thing to the kinds of conversations we had to have about math when calculators were an issue, but um, ChatGPT is not also not remotely intelligent, right? There's no intelligence, it's predictive, right? It's, it, you need to also understand the limits of the technology so you're not out there telling people like, oh, you're going to fall in love with your AI, like whatever, but it's, it's not intelligent. It is not creative and it can only produce what's already been produced. And my students are getting ready to produce shit that has never been thought before. And that's what excites me about education, right? So, you know, 
if you can use that to do some of it okay but like the stuff that hasn't ever been done before like i don't i don't think that something that's mining the detritus of the internet is going to be able to produce you know what one creative human brain is going to be doing tomorrow so i don't know i can't do a keynote on that one somebody else is hopefully working on it um yeah um, I want to talk about, ask about software, so I'll start with a comment and other than a question. I teach the JS program here at UNEM and the School of Marine Environmental Programs, and so I've, uh, all of my classes we use QGIS, which is an open source JS software, so the students, when they graduate, take it with them, they don't have licensing problems, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing I struggle with, uh, and I've, I have some solutions to this, but I'd love your thoughts, is, you know, the employers want the ArcGIS or other software that's proprietary to them. And so I, my students have activities to do those, but how, you know, how do we move to open source software to teach our students with for all of these benefits, yet still prepare them for the workforce where they're expected to know proprietary software? Yeah. I mean, that's again, that same question with the PDFs of like, how, there's a little ant right there, and I'm just gonna let go, just let go. Um, <laughs> I was almost gonna, but then I thought this is a very equity, care, you know, and like to have compassion and how would you do? Um, yeah, so it's the same thing about like, you know, again, who am I to critique capitalism? Um, but there's some interesting conversations to be had about about that. So there's issues where. Um, there's solutions where you could do things like, for example, um, talk to the company, you know, and this is part of what Highland also wants, public private partnerships, right? Not a big fan, um, because a lot of times private industry is basically just getting like workforce training for, you know, and, and they're also getting like a sort of an endless cycle of fresh employees who know just what they need to know and then aren't able necessarily to grow in the company because we're always training up the fresh new employees. So there's issues with that, but in a public-private partnership kind of way, um, we can think about like, can I partner with private industry to allow our institution to have certain kinds of access to certain kinds of things for certain amounts of time that will allow our students to, to move with it. But I think the other thing is, um, you know, music, right? Um, you can understand certain proprietary parts of music, just like with my friend who's the poet at Plymouth State. I don't want to openly license her poetry volumes, right? I want people to support the presses that are releasing her poetry volumes, and I want poets who are not academics to be able to make a living off of writing poems, and my husband, God love him, is a sculptor, right? So, like, I'm all about paying for art and supporting art. The idea of the tools that make art, though, being um, priced in certain ways that only certain people can access them or use them is another challenge, right, that we, that we may want to work on institutionally. So I think the, the question for me would be, could you involve in some ways your students in the conversation about uh, the, the way money works in music, the way sort of proprietary licensing works in music, um, and, and sort of in an ethics sense, get them to develop a sense of, of what their ethical beliefs are about what should be available in an open forum and what things you know, we should be paying for. Because I think all of us would agree that in music, there are certain things we want to pay for, you know, we want to support. Um, so that might be the best way is like, you know, if you need to do some workarounds where you get partnerships, where things are funded for students, but if there's also a way to get your students involved because they're the future corporate owners, you know, of the companies that are going to be producing these, the softwares that are, that are going to get used. So whenever I run into a thorny question that suggests that doesn't have like an easy solution or an easy answer, it suggests to me that it's going to be the next generation that's going to sort it out. So the biggest thing you can do is bring your students into your challenge, right? Hey, we use all this open source stuff. Isn't it great? Like you noticed you haven't had to pay for this or whatever. 
when you graduate and you get a job, here's what's going to happen. What do we think about this? What are the solutions? What are the ideas? And, and you just sort of pull them in. It was one of the great benefits of that anthology project that I worked on with my students was that they started thinking about, oh yeah, like these textbooks are written and who's making money off them and how do they get paid for? And if I'm gonna be a, a literature scholar, like how am I gonna live and get fed and get paid for like get paid for my work and who's making my, the money off of this stuff? And these are conversations that are salient to everything we do. Also, our higher ed budgets are are a mess right now, right? Like I'm guessing. I mean, I already know this about both UNE and USM. Like you're you're struggling in very similar ways to Plymouth State, and all of this is a is attached right to the questions of how the money flows in all of our fields. Um, so I encourage you to you know, not hide the challenges that you have with your students and the ethical dilemmas that you have and just you know, bring them into it. It's not, a, not an answer really, but yeah. During your talk, you mentioned that there are uh, peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed open access resources. Um, I've been trying to find different copies of a statistics book in the behavioral sciences with the help of the library, and they've been amazing helping me find some. And I have three that I'm considering, but um, I'm kind of intrigued by the fact that some of them are peer-reviewed and some of them are not. How can you tell which is which? Yeah. That's a great question, and the first thing I will say, which you already mentioned, is like, it's really hard to do work in OER without good librarians. And depending on how long your librarians have been here, a lot of them are also learning along with you because, you know, depending on what, like, now you go to library school, like, it, it, all of this stuff is part of it, but it wasn't, you know, at a certain point. Um, so I really, really appreciate the librarians who are learning this stuff because one of the challenges with OER that you found is like, with the exception of maybe a couple of fields, like statistics kind of is one, but um, it's not just like, okay, Robin, you convinced me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get that OER textbook. It's like you sit down at the computer, like, you know, it's just a fire hose of stuff, right? And that's because there's not a centralized place, like one place where you like go and you're like, I want peer reviewed, so and there it is, right? And this is also what's good, right? Because generally, when we centralize all academic things into one place, we get Pearson. You know, like what I mean? We, we want to be decentralized, right, to a certain degree. We want um, there to be many points of entry. Um, the other issue with OER, if you think about it, is like, um, the position of the global north in the production of OER. So if, if you if you concentrate all the OER into only the places that are the most organized with the best high-tech metadata and search functions and whatever, you are gonna get a lot of OER written by the most privileged voices, which is really not exactly the point. We wanna create a publishing industry that allows um, more diversity, more uh, more checks and balances, that kind of stuff. So the, the decentralization is a strength, but it's also a real challenge for faculty. That's why I highly encourage us to recognize that while OER is free to use for students, it is not free to create, it's not free to search for, so it's academic labor is written all over this thing, right? So for God's sake, like you're a contingent faculty member, you make $3,000 a course, and somebody says, go find some OER, you know? I would have one response to that, and it would just look like one finger. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's why it's really important to offer uh, grants when you can to faculty who are looking at OER or willing to review OER. It's why it's important to open faculty development um, opportunities to contingent faculty and to stipend them for it because they're not paid for that time. Um, but there are some great places to look. But I will say that the the peer reviewed non peer reviewed thing is 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 interesting. So first of all, you know, there's lots of different ways that um, commercial textbooks get get published as well, right? Sometimes it may be a very smart man is hired to do something and he publishes it. It may be a whole board, you know, of however many editors who are putting this over. So just the same way you would look at any 
piece, you, you will look at the OER. Um, but in general, if you're looking at someplace like OpenStax, someplace like BC Campus, the, the big publishing homes of OER, um, you'll be able to, to look in the front matter just like you would with anything and see here's the editorial board. Like the, so my, my open textbook in American literature is called the Open Anthology of Earlier American Literature. You can get my version. It says edited by Robin DeRosa with like 25 students and right underneath it it says beware, you know, like <laughs> here's what this is. And, um, but the version that's going to come out from uh, Rebus Community is, is publishing it. They're a, a, a great um, publishing company. But you'll see right on the, on the table of contents page, opposite that, you'll see their editorial board. You'll be able to look at their uh, credentials. So you know, you're just going to basically analyze it the way you would analyze um, any book. If you use um, my favorite search engine for OER, there's many of them, is Oasis. It's out of SUNY Geneseo. Um, I like it because it's so easy and elegant, um, and it basically looks like Google, and you just type it in, and you'll be able to sort. Um, it doesn't really sort by quote unquote peer review because, to be honest, we don't have a definition of peer. Like, what's peer review? Like, my peer looked at it. It's review, right? Um, but you'll be able to sort it by the kinds of publishers. You'll also be able. Um, many of these sites have like Open Textbook Network or whatever. They have reviews from faculty users. The other thing we've done in New Hampshire, and you may have a similar thing um, for New Hampshire Open, which is our statewide collaborative, um, we have a hub, an OER hub, and we only put into that hub the things that people in, New, in our New Hampshire higher ed systems are using. So it's also helpful to be like, oh, what are they using at Keene State Biology? Like, I want to see that. So sometimes looking at your peer institutions and what OER they've adopted can be a, another helpful way. But start with your librarians. I'm assuming that you have or will stand up soon um, a LibGuide or a OER guide. Every campus should have a LibGuide. So if you don't have one, maybe ask your librarians. The cool thing is they don't need to, to make it because they just steal it from the other LibGuides. It's called sharing, right? Um, but really, it's just on, your, on the library website, a, a portal or page that's dedicated to looking for OER. So it'll have the top ways of searching um, for OER. And it's a great place to, to start on your campus. So start with a librarian. Um, but remember, sometimes you don't want a peer-reviewed piece. It depends on the pedagogy, right? Like You may want to try a new activity. Um, and there's lots of assignments that are OERs, and you know you don't. It's gonna it's gonna get worse and worse the more people who have to agree with it, right? So um, it's fine to use a mix of materials, but you know if you are running a new statistics course and you want a backbone, you know text to build off of, it's probably best to go with something like OpenStax or BC Campus or any of those other big publishing houses that have teams that create it. But yeah, Oasis, I would recommend that one. And talk to your librarian and say, do we have a LibGuide? If not, can you stand up a page that would get us started um, with, as, a, as a portal? Oh, push. Yeah. Oh, keep it pushed. Hello. <laughs> I'm Beth Dyer from the library. We do have a page, a website. It's called Affordable Course Materials. It has links to all of those search engines, Open Textbook Library, OpenStax. Um, and one of our librarians, Sonia Journey, is currently enrolled in the OEN um, uh, OER librarian certification course. So we're kind of early in this process. We're learning, like you said, yeah. alongside with everybody. Um, but we're um, really eager to, to help. So please reach out and we're, we'd love to get this going. We're also looking for funding to um, do some workshops and sort of um, help provide stipends for faculty to do things like review textbooks and, and um, adopt materials. So um, That's awesome. And the biggest thing I would say is there's no rush. You've gone the last 15 years overcharging your students. Like, there's no reason to be like, I can't do this tomorrow. Like, take take a year, you know, and just be like, by the end, because I don't know what your load is, but at Plymouth State is ridiculous, right? Like, I mean, I, 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 anyway, I, my daughter goes to a very elite institution. I was talking to one of her professors, and he mentioned his teaching load, one zero. I, like, I, I couldn't even understand what he was telling me, you know? I was like, what do you mean, one, zero? Like, what? Um, so my guess is your loads look more like mine at Plymouth State. Um, so you really, 
you have to think about your time. You don't want to burn out. So think about by that. You know, it's by the end of this summer. I would like to have done some searches in my field and made a, made a list of different things. Over the semester, I would like to, you know, choose one of these to do. And then over the spring, I'm not even going to use it yet. I'm just going to work on making a, a syllabus and getting things ready so that next, you know, fine, do it right, right? Do, do it slow, take all the time you need, especially if your institution does not come through with supports. Um, the other kinds of support I like to see from institutions besides some seed money, and seed money, I'm literally talking about, uh, you know, at the, at the top end, some crazy institutions will pay $3,000 for a um, faculty member. What I normally see, though, is more in the vicinity of $400 to $1,500 um, for you to participate in, say, a year-long thing where you learn a couple things and, and move a course to OER. Uh, it doesn't take a lot. But in addition, the other supports you should be getting for your institution include instructional design support, um, academic technology support, and library support. Many of our institutions, I mean mine included, I run our instructional design shop. We have one instructional designer. We have one librarian who like sort of, she's nice enough to do OER, but it's not really part of her job. Like everybody is under-resourced for this work, but it's important that if you're going to take this on, it's really helpful to know the name of someone who you know knows a lot about how Canvas works and can help you figure out how to make um, your OER suddenly just appear in your Canvas. Like there's lots of, lots of people who can um, help you on the on the journey. So I would I would encourage if you put if you're putting something together for your campus to think about a wraparound support, a tiny bit of money. And then a little team. Here's your librarian, here's your technologist, and here's your designer. They're all here, one meeting each in the semester. Gives you, gives you some place to go. Um, I think we have time for another one. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so <clears throat> just if we extend the idea of open to uh, the learning management system, and I'm not going to get into a open learning management systems thing, which we could get into, but where do students submit their work, right? And, and so, and, and of course, many of the textbooks that are not OER, you know, I adopt this textbook, I get all the plugins, all the quizzes, everything comes right in there, does the grading automatically for me. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, so if you could just maybe yeah, and there's, there's really two questions there. One is about the ancillary stuff that comes with commercial textbooks. And the other is about um, where students work. The ancillary stuff, I will say, um, OER is, is catching up. The biggest issue is, you know, they've got billions of dollars to funnel at the bells and whistles. But I, and so sometimes that stuff legitimately is better. Um, you will either decide that's worth it because it's better and my students deserve the best, or you'll decide. I'm, I'm propping up a system that ultimately does more harm than good. You know, I can't answer that for you. Um, but OER is catching up with the ancillaries. I doubt they will ever be you know, as slick because we don't have the investment dollars at this point in, in this side of things. Um, but we do have really smart computer scientists. We do have graphic designers. Why? Because we're faculty, right? Like We have all the expertise. So we're starting to have those. So most open textbooks in, for example, the social sciences will have the test banks, right? Um, My Open Math is a very famous, right? It's all, it, it has, it, it, I mean, you can't have a math program anymore that doesn't have the online, I mean, people aren't using paper textbooks for that stuff so much anymore. So, so we have all that in OER, so it's worth looking at it and it's catching up. But it's it's absolutely true that um, you know there, there you'll see a difference in the in the slickness and sometimes that might you might feel like um, that's going to have a difference in your students' learning. So something to evaluate. I would say the learning management system um, is a problem. I, I'd say a couple things. I'd say that is an example, in my opinion, of a, of an industry selling us something we probably didn't exactly need. Like maybe we needed something for you know it, it got so over designed and now we are stuck inside a thing that actually i think often does more damage to our students than good they are going to graduate into a world that does not have canvas 
you know, controlling every aspect of their thing, right? Even something like Microsoft, which is what the environment we have here, Google campus or Microsoft campus, um, you know, it's not as walled, right? So uh, we really cut it, like, I, the slide I usually use to describe this is um, Canvas, Black, what were you guys use? Brightspace. Brightspace. It's like Alcatraz, right? So it's an island, it's really hard to get in, it's really hard to get out. Like you want your faculty member to come look at your course, like you get 17 permissions from IT to get your faculty member in there. Your students can't, you know. And then the worst of the thing is that the semester ends and you need to copy that course over for the next semester. So what do you do? You delete out all the student work in the greatest symbolism of what mattered and what didn't matter in the semester, right? You basically say to your students, every single thing you produce in this class is destined for the deletion bin. And I thought that was just a horrible way of designing education. You could say, well, that's not how we really, you know, but that's the symbolics of it. So instead, um, like we use Canvas. I, I do some things in Canvas. It's a great place for the grade book, I think. Um, sometimes I use it as a portal for, it's a good place to put a copyrighted, you know, material that you need to use. Um, but in general, I try to think about um, the phrase we generally use is non-disposable assignments, at least having some of them. So whether my students are contributing to a textbook, um, whether they're, um, you know, like the, like the library walking tour of Lewiston, right? Um, we want to think about having our students have some opportunity for sharing work in a way that it's not going to die. Every student in the, in the customized program, um, customized major program we started, I took over a program that has been there since 1974 with an average of 10 students per year. It's customized interdisciplinary studies, students making their own majors. So we always had just a few students, they were trying to complete college or just you know weird, weird stuff. When I took it over, we made some differences, it, only pedagogical, right? Nothing substantive, there was no requirement change. All we did is we said, okay, when you come into this program, you're going to design a domain of your own, and that's where you're going to work, um, because you have to do the work of integrating all these diverse things into something that is cohesive. So you're going to do that work on the web. We didn't force anybody into this. People need agency and choice, and there's a lot of privacy issues that we spent a long time talking about. But for the most part, those students all have a domain of their own. I'll tell you, in two years, program went from 10 students um, to a high of 125 students. We only have 3,800 students at Plymouth State. It's one of our biggest majors now. Um, all we did was basically say, your work matters. We're not going to delete it. We think what you're doing is real. We want you to drive your own education. Like We just sent all the messages here. We decided instead of just saying them, we would actually do them. Right? When we said your work matters, we would say, like, are we are, do we have an architecture that proves that, or is the architecture working against the message? And so when we changed all that stuff, the students just blossomed. They just responded so beautifully. So I think it's probably not possible to say that you are making lifelong learners if your students never get out of Canvas. It's, a, it's too walled of a garden, and that's not how learning happens anymore. In, a, in an internet world, all our fields are connected. And so um, I, I think it is important to find ways. And, and for some people, that's more like service learning, right? It doesn't mean you have to be on the internet necessarily, but you can't be stuck in a discussion board in Brightspace for the rest of your life, right? That, that would be my gut. So I would encourage you to push outside of the LMS a little bit if you haven't before. Um, and then maybe this would be, is, is this, this is the end? One last question. Yeah. It's not a question. I'll just tell you that at UAV, we do have an e-portfolio um, process. So if anybody wants to learn more about that, I'm Jen Janako. You can email me. I'll leave the question to be left to someone who has a question. Or that could, you know, could be a final comment, uh, unless somebody has a burning one that you want to get in before, before we eat. Um, well, I just want to thank you all so much. I, I'm going to stick around for lunch uh, before I make the, the long and winding trek back to New Hampshire, which is really not very far away, but there's no road that goes there. Um, but it's, just, it's, it's a super nice um, drive, and I will try to avoid all of your um, squirrels with, like, you know, tags in their ears. Um, 
But thank you so much for inviting me here. It's been great. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad some people get a chance to sit and talk with you and, and ask more questions. That's wonderful. I'm, I am going to take, so we're going to have a poster session that's going to start at 1230. So I'm going to invite the people that are presenting posters to go up and get food first. Um, so why don't you go up and get your food. Um, and then um, everybody else, we pull the table out. So try to make a line on each side. It's not quite set up for a line each side. I'm sure we'll figure it out, and, um, and that will help everybody get through the line a bit faster. Um, so we have an hour for lunch. Um, again, the posters are going to be set up back here, um, and those will start at 1230.